the Wheelie Podcast. Let your iPod bloom. Well, it seems that all is well with the world again. I came down to the pond last night and uh, noticed some frog spawn at both ends. A completely different place to where it was last year in abundance. And I thought, fantastic, that's a, that's a great sign. I, was, uh, I came down to uh, cut some pea sticks out of the hedge. Uh, essentially just short little whips of hazel. And as, I, uh, as I've just been in the house now, I was looking out the bedroom window down across the pond, and I noticed all this writhing around at the end. So I got the binoculars out, and I could see all these scores of froggies doing their springtime thing. In fact, there are a lot more frogs this year than there were last year. And you just get the feeling, today... It's a typically March day, broken clouds, showers, brisk wind, but it's mild. And the birds seem to be singing less nervously than they were. That song thrush has more consistency in its voice. And I've seen more shenanigans, certainly. And obviously these guys were just waiting for the worst of the weather to pass, you know, they were conscious that we could get another big freeze up. And which, of course, I suppose we still could, but it's unlikely that if we did now that it would last or be anywhere near as severe as it was in February. So as I look across the end of the pond now, I can see lots of little black heads poking out of the mix of ranunculus and blanket weed that the pond seems to be inundated with. But that's fabulous. So hopefully, in a couple of months' time, I'll see those great big, dark rafts of tadpoles that I saw in the pond last year. Brilliant. Hello listener, welcome to this week's sprightly springtime wiggly podcast. This is fairly unique, Um, not only am I introducing the show on my own, which isn't unique I hasten to add, but I'm doing so for my own garden. Some of you will be aware that uh, Heaven Phil are stateside this week, Heather's giving probably a fantastic presentation to an American audience, so I'm going to do my bit and just introduce this week's wiggly podcast. Now, various features this week. First off, we've got Rachel Harry's doing a seed swap in Herefordshire. Then, because this week, beginning 23rd of March, is Worm Week, some of you will be aware of that, but uh, for those of you that aren't, you're going to get a lowdown on uh, on just that. And then I'm going to leave you on what is doubtless one of the most beautiful springtime days that I've known for a long time. So, without further ado, let's listen to what Rachel Harries has to say about seed swapping. Okay, so I'm here on a lovely sunny Saturday with Suzanne and Keith at the seed swap at the Cafe Green in Hereford. So, tell me, what's it, what's it all about? What's the seed swap about? Well, this is our second year doing the seed swap. We just started it on a whim, really, didn't we? We, <laughs> we thought it would be a nice thing to do. Because um, gardeners always swap seeds and plants with each other anyway, don't they? But uh, a seed swap is a, is a more organised way of doing that. And people bring whatever seeds and plants they've got from their own gardens, anything going spare, and just spread it out on the tables in the other room and then help themselves with whatever they fancy. And it works very well. Lots of people here. Yes, yeah, it's great. Yeah. And lots of different varieties of seeds. And some of the seeds are these her- heritage seeds, which you really can't buy and sell. Mm. So you have to swap them. That's the only way you can trade in them. We get sent a big box each year by the Heritage Seed Library, which is based at Wrighton and Coventry, yes. mm-hmm. because they maintain all these old varieties that are now no longer available commercially. 
and they're lovely. I mean, lots of the people have come back to us this year saying that they had some last year, and you know, this bean was fantastic, and this kale was wonderful, and and th- these are things that gardeners are just not allowed to buy anymore, thanks to the EU rules. Mm. Can you explain a little bit about the EU rules. Well, the EU has a list. They carry a list of seeds which you are allowed to sell, and this list is changed slightly and compiled each year. But it's restrictive. There's an awful lot that is not on the list. And seed producers have to pay to get a seed on the list, to get it tested and and verified Mm. to get it on the list. So producers that only sell a few hundred packets of this and a few hundred of that are just not going to register them all. Mm -hmm. And what it means is that all the the good commercial varieties are on the list, but not necessarily the ones that the gardeners want. They're not quite appropriate. I mean, for instance, on peas, a lot of the heritage peas grow an awful lot taller. So if you're on a small plot, you can actually grow, you can get an awful lot more peas for your square meterage. Oh, they're much more productive than these squat little things, aren't they? And I, I personally, I'd given up growing peas. It was just a waste of time until I came across these heritage varieties. Yeah. It's because the machinery only harvests the short ones. And so these are the ones that are, tend to be commercially available, would be the, sh- the short ones? Yes. Short, yes. And, they all har- and they all tend to come in to you know, harvest at the same time, whereas the, the, the heritage ones, the older varieties, they crop over, diff- over, over longer periods as well, which is much more suited to the gardener. And then the tomatoes, the, the commercial ones and the ones that are on the list, tend to be the ones that are, again, they crop all at the same time and they've got nice tough skins so that they can be transported. Battered about a bit. Yeah, that's, right, that's right. But what the gardeners <coughs> want is successive cropping and a good taste and a thin skin. And those are the ones that aren't on the list. We've got masses of different tomatoes. Yeah, there. I picked up some varieties there that I've never heard of before. What have I got here on my... Um, I was looking through and, th- and thinking, OK, recommends. I've got My Girl, Hermosa, and... What's it? Tibet Appel. Never heard of them before. But I'll just see, won't I? <laughs> yeah. 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 yeah, I found some of the heritage varieties actually grow better outdoors. Mm. Uh, there's one there, the Tibetan one, I think. That's a pretty good outdoor variety. I suppose the benefit of a seed swap like this is if the people there who bought the seeds in themselves that they've got left over, then they've grown them so they know what conditions they. Mm. Yes, you they get a lot of that. Long involved conversations <laughs> about which bean to grow and why, and <laughs> yeah, some things that have done well for someone else in the county. Mm-hmm. So it suits this part of the country. Do you say that people can only bring organic seeds, or are you no, kind of no, open? No, no anything at all. No. I'm trying to give people information as well about you know, certain about growing different plants and harvesting and saving the seeds because a lot of plants cross pollinate, so you've got to be very careful with those. So we we've got lists of information instructions of what to do. Mm. It's not got, very easy, like peas. If you, if you collect some peas and, and keep them and sow them next year, they'll be exactly the same as the ones you sowed. But others will cross-pollinate and you'll get something weird. And so these, I mean, one that seeds from, the, say, the Her- Her- Heritage Seed Catalogue, these are different from the packets that you get that always say hybrid or F- F1, because that's something that's can yes. I've not quite understood. Yes. And the, the, the Heritage Seed won't be F1s. What does that mean? An F1? an F1 means that it's a product of two different varieties as parent plants and that on its own it's probably not that viable genetically. So if you sowed the product of your F1 plants, you probably won't get the same again. And some F1 varieties are very good, but it's not, they're not sustainable in the way that these seeds are. You can't keep generating the same thing each year. And they're not helpful for the gardener, are they? Because you have to go back to the same... You always have to go back, uh-huh. to, the, back to the producer and buy another packet, yes. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> Which I think is the idea. <laughs> yeah. Isn't it? Yeah, that's right. <laughs> so what's the most unusual seeds that you've had people bring here or that you've found in a seed swap? Oh, well, I grew some of Tony's asparagus peas last year. They were strange. It's like a pea plant with beautiful red flowers all over it. It's absolutely stunning. I'll grow it in the, in the ornamental garden in the future. And then it's got pods on it that look a bit like ladies' fingers. Mm-hmm. 
and then you cook them like mange too. And they're quite tasty, but as soon as they get longer than about two inches, they're really, really stringy. <laughs> mm. And do they taste of asparagus? Is that why well, they're called I, asparagus? Yeah, or? they're supposed to. I, I didn't oh, think they did. Good. I wasn't wildly impressed with them. <laughs> but they are absolutely beautiful to look at, so I'll be growing some in there you go. as an ornamental. Mm. Okay. Then, runner beans came to this country as an ornamental plant in the first place as well. Similarly, they've got beautiful flowers. I grew out a French bean last year. It had a wonderful Indian name, Pawnee. What's it called? Pawnee, yes. Pawnee, yeah. Pawnee. And it had those gorgeous, almost like purpley green beans, which again, if you got them at the right time, longer than they'd be going, you know, four or five inches, they were absolutely delicious. Mm-hmm. But totally different colour than an average French bean. A lot more interesting. Yes, a lot of these beans have North American origins, don't they? Mm. Pawnee is one of the one of the North American tribes, yeah. and there's the Cherokee Trail of Tears as well, which is another lovely bean, mm. really nice tasting bean, and and that was that was supposedly carried by the, the Cherokee on their journeys, and when they were chucked off their their ancestral lands, they they carried it with them. And, they knew what they were doing when they came to beans. There's a lot of of bean enthusiasts here today, aren't there? Well, I'm Frank, really. He's infected us all. Frank, the apple and the bean expert. Because, I mean, seed swaps happen all over the country about this time of year, don't they? Is it? Mm. There's a Mm. seedy Sunday. Is that about this weekend? Yes, there are lots of them. There are lists up, yeah. Brighton has CD Sunday and they have a list of other mm. seed swaps all over the country. Garden Organic people put a list up as well. Mm. I guess, yeah, the timing is obviously as people are starting to think, ah, seeds, time to start sowing, so it's, the timing's perfect. Mm. So, what should I be sowing th- uh, this weekend then of, of the seeds that I've picked up today? Onions, onion seeds, I can sow onion seeds, can't onion I? Seeds. Yes, you can sow the onions, yes, yes. If, you, if you're growing, if you've got a polytunnel or greenhouse, you can put the tomatoes in there. No, not yet. Oh, We're well nice. thinking of digging up <laughs> part of the driveway and putting a polytunnel there. <laughs> That's good. Yes. You don't need a car after all. <laughs> no, goodness, no. <laughs> some, some people brought seed potatoes. You'd be chitting your potatoes. Oh, yes, yes. there were some seed potatoes. Yeah. 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 Great. Well, thank you very much. It's really nice to talk to you, and I might go back in now and just sort of like record random conversations of people which mm. no doubt will probably be about beans <laughs> <laughs> cool thank, thank you very you. much I hope that worked that was brilliant it's an interesting thing that seed swaps are happening all over the country now so what a wonderful opportunity to go and meet like minded people and swap the overflow from uh, previous year's harvest nice one Rachel anyway uh, without further ado, let's go and uh, have a listen to what Vicky Kindemba from Bug Life has to say about Worm Week. Hello, Vicky. I've introduced you uh, more formally than that. Uh, you're, you're Vicky Kindemba and you're a conservation officer from Bug Life. But I think I may well have talked about uh, Bug Life before on the Wiggly podcast. Anyway, it's great to speak to you at long last. We've been planning this for a while. And really, it's, uh, it's all about Worm Week which begins on the, on the 23rd of March. Oh, there are weeks for everything now. Um, but I was just, just wondering if you, if you could tell us a little bit about your work and quite a lot about Worm Week. OK, yeah. Well, to tell you a bit about Bug Life, first of all, we're the only UK charity and also the only charity in Europe as well that works towards conserving all invertebrate species. Right. So that's everything from spiders and snails to water beetles and crayfish as well. So everything that's small that doesn't have a backbone. OK. How many, how many uh, of there are you that uh, are employed by Bug Life, volunteers aside? We're quite small at the moment. Um, we have eight members of staff. We try hard to get the message out sort of all over the UK and further about how important bugs are. I've often read that uh, well, many people that describe bug life uh, often say that it's, a, it's an organisation that punches well above its weight. And I think that's absolutely right because you often 
Um, I think one of the most significant moments of my experience of bug life was I was listening to Radio 2 one morning. I think it was probably a Terry Wogan show. And on the news came a song. It was the, uh, it was the 12 Days of Christmas. And it, was the, it was the 12 Bugs of Christmas that you guys had done for various reasons. But it was fantastic. And I thought, well, there you are. There probably sort of 10 million people will certainly have listened to that tune at that, uh, that moment in time. Which is wonderful, and so and people, I think, are becoming more aware of the significance of invertebrates. But of course, they are hugely important, aren't they, to the welfare of of all flora and fauna, really, including human beings, of course. People don't realise that. Now, uh, you guys are having a, a launching uh, on the 23rd of March at uh, uh, this this uh, this week, um, which is which is called Worm Week. Well, what's that going to entail exactly? Well, we're targeting primary schools mainly, getting them out into their school grounds and to do a bit of worm charming. That's what? something that you might see in, uh, in in Morocco when you're walking through uh, is it Marrakech. <laughs> yeah, not quite, but it's kind of an old-fashioned thing that people have used in the past for uh, getting worms to collect them to use for fish bait and things. But it's basically... Um, making a noise and causing vibrations on the ground which causes the earthworms to come come up to the surface um so we're getting school children out to have a go at worm charming and find out how many worms they have in their school playing fields i mean how, why do worms respond to vibrations I, i've often I, I get asked that question all the time and i i kind of think it's probably because it's a, it's a sort of catalyst to encourage them to come to the surface and perhaps mate and draw food in you know perhaps they think it's kind of the pitter patter of rainfall i mean is that is that the case um the rainfall because often their burrows get flooded um so so that does encourage them to the surface but also um vibrations from moles burrowing um through the ground so they know that they're predators nearby right. and that they might get eaten so the safest place to go is up to the surface oh wow okay <laughs> that's amazing and of course it, it works doesn't it you know people sort of stamping mm-hmm. around on the ground they uh, they do quite literally uh, come to the come to the top and i i guess um it's, it's a wonderful thing for kids to be able to do it's, it's it's real fun you know they can go and kind of run around trample about a bit and uh, and pick up these worms and and have a good look at them definitely and we're doing it as a as a competition as well so the school that charms the most worms they'll get a free bug day with the bug man who will come round to their school and tell them all about all about worms and other bugs as well. Yeah, that's quite exciting. And so, how do, what does that include? It includes having some live bugs in the classroom, finding out a bit more about them, having a chance to hold a few, and just learn a bit more about bugs and why why they're important. That's amazing. And uh, what other stuff have you got on, uh, during the course of that week? We've also got poetry competition, again, for children, uh, which is getting kids to think about how they feel and what they think about worms, so to write that down and to do some nice drawings as well. And again, there'll be prizes for the poetry competition, which have been kindly donated by Wiggly Wigglers, so prizes include a can of worms and an insect observatory. It's a wonderful thing for Wigglers to do is donate the prize because, I, you know, it's, it's certainly a worthy cause. I mean, how do you find uh, kids are? I mean, I, I've always found kids to be hugely enthusiastic when you go into school and they get the chance to, to look at and handle worms. I mean, do you find the same kind of thing? Definitely. I think especially younger children are just fascinated by animals and particularly insects. And they're not normally as scared either of insects and and invertebrates in general they they're just fascinated and want to learn more about them and brilliant i mean yes you know you're a um are you a biologist your background i'm an ecologist okay uh so you will have had uh, spent uh, several uh fruitful hours i imagine studying uh, all things worm-like so, uh, I mean, in your opinion, why, it is, why is it that uh, the earthworms are so important? Well, they're just essential for maintaining soil. They recycle the dead plant matter back into the soil, which allows nutrients to be retained by the soils. And so allowing good plant growth and sustaining agriculture and all the food production in the UK without, without the humble earthworm would be in a lot of trouble and be going very hungry. 
What's the uh, sort of current earthworm uh, status in the UK? I, I've read recently that earthworms are in quite dramatic decline, certainly as a consequence of conventional agriculture, you know, constant tillage, ploughing and the like. Um, and is, is that the case? Well, certainly research has shown that in certain areas that are intensively farmed, um, things like compaction, uh, where the soil gets very densely packed together because of heavy machinery on the soil it's uh, too dense for earthworms to make burrows in so they can't live in that soil and also use of things like pesticides um, which they're vulnerable to because they're soft-bodied animals and so chemicals are easily absorbed through their skin Um, so both these things sort of reduce the numbers of worms quite often in intensively farmed areas. Okay. Uh, so how can people help earthworms? I mean, what's a few simple things that, that people can do in order to encourage more earthworm life, life into, their, into their gardens or even onto their farmland for that matter? In terms of your garden, the best things you can do is sort of have quite a messy garden. So you've, well, it doesn't have to be a complete mess, but have areas where you have dead wood and leaves. So it's a great food source for the worms to sort of recycle that back into the soil for you. Also, reducing the amount of pesticides you use, trying to find natural methods of controlling pests will also help maintain your earthworm numbers. Also, having something like a compost heap or a wormery is a good way of using earthworms in your garden to help your garden and create good fertilizer for your garden. Fantastic. Um, and what should people avoid doing uh, in, in order to, uh, you know, in order to avoid compromising the earthworm populations in their green space? Yeah, I've already mentioned sort of uh, reducing the use of pesticides. Also, again, reducing compaction of your soil. So reducing sort of heavy weights such as heavy machinery on soil will sort of make the soil not as dense, and so earthworms can easily burrow in the, in the soil. And also avoid using sort of acidic fertilisers. They, as most earthworm species, prefer uh, alkaline conditions. So, yeah, best not to use those to have healthy earthworm populations. Okay, well, that's fantastic. Well, it's been a it's been a real pleasure speaking to you. And uh, in order for people to to get involved with this uh, with this worm week and get involved with with bug life for that matter, what's the best way for them to to get in touch? The best way is to go onto our website, which is www.buglife.org.uk, and on there it has all the information about how to take part on wor- in Worm Week. It has information about gardening tips, educational materials for teachers, and it also has a bit about our new worm poster, which will soon be available, which tells you all about worms and how, how you can help them. And also, there's a survey going on by Opal, which is the Open Air Laboratories, which is looking at earthworms, uh, which people can get involved with. And there'll be a link on our website through to that as well. Okay, and I th- I, I'm, I'm under the impression that Opal is sending out free survey packs to people that would like to get involved to, to be able to find out how many and indeed what type of earthworms they've got living in their garden. Yeah, they can either be sent to pack or they're they're downloadable on the web from Opal. Okay, that's wonderful. Well, it's been a pleasure speaking to you, Vicky, and thank you very much. And I hope all goes well during the week of the uh, of the twenty third. And uh, you know, I wish you well. Okay, thank you. Cheers. Now, just before I leave you guys, I uh, seem to be magnetised by my pond this year. I came down earlier today, and the frogs have gone, but the toads have moved in. And I thought I'd just leave you from this week's edition of the Wonderful Wiggly Podcast with the voices of equally wonderful things. Bye-bye, listener.